Hello and welcome. This is Chuba with ArcheryHistorian.com, and in this video we will explore the history of the Huns and their weapon of choice, the composite horse bow. The Huns hold a special place for me, being Hungarian. The Huns always had a mystical and mysterious aura about them. My father would tell me stories of the Huns as a child, and as I grew older and learned more about them I became fascinated. To the 4th century Western Europeans, the Huns came seemingly out of nowhere, pillaged and destroyed as they liked, then vanished. They had no written records of their own, and so most of what we know about them comes to us from the records of their adversaries, which carry an obvious bias. The main sources come to us from Jordanes, the 6th century Roman bureaucrat, and Priscus from the 5th century AD, the Greek historian and Roman diplomat, the latter of which wrote of a dinner he had with the Hunnic king at his palace. Origins The Huns' origins are shrouded in mystery, myth, and legend. Most Hungarians know of the origin myth, which explains the origins of both the tribe of the Huns and their cousin tribe, the Magyars. The myth is commonly known as the legend of the white stag, or the legend of the wondrous hind. A summarized version goes something like this. Many ages ago, there lived the great hunter Nimrod, and he had two twin sons. They were named Hunor and Magor. They grew up as hunters, much like their father, and on one occasion they were out on a hunt when a wondrous white stag appears before them. Being enchanted by the beast, they give chase and move east. Eventually they lose the hind, but they end up in a bountiful land rich in game. They settle here for a while, but eventually move further west, where they encounter some beautiful maidens singing. They are once again enchanted, this time by the attractive young women, and so decide to kidnap them and marry them as was once the custom. The descendants of Hum Hunor and his new wife would become the Huns, and the descendants of Magar and his new bride would become the Magyars. Jordanes, writing in the 6th century AD, describes Philomir, king of the Goths, coming from the north in the area of modern Scandinavia, marching south to Scythia, which is just north of the Black Sea, where he found and expelled a retinue of witches. These sorceresses would become the ancestors of the Huns. Amienus Marcellinus, a Roman soldier and later a historian, wrote of the Huns as savages who would cut their cheeks of their infants. Scarification was practiced amongst the Huns, the idea being that the infant Hun warriors should know what it is like to be inflicted with wounds before they can have their mother's milk. He describes the Huns as being a very hardy people, as they required no fire and lived on the roots of wild plants as well as the half-cooked flesh of cattle, which they quote-unquote cook by placing the meat between their saddle and their horse, and after several hours of hard riding, the meat would be tenderized and somewhat cooked. They never frequented any building and wandered in the wilderness. From the cradle, they were accustomed to endure frost, hunger, and thirst. The Huns are described as wearing coverings of linen and the skins of wood mice stitched together. Nor have they any change of garment, and they don't take off that which they put on until it is reduced to rags and drops off. Their head are covered in fur caps and their shoes are very poorly fitted so they do not make good infantrymen. They are almost growing to the backs of their horses. They do everything on horseback, eat, trade, fight, and even lay on the horse's neck and sleep. Indeed, what made the Huns so formidable in battle was their skills with the bow on horseback. At a distance they fight with missile weapons pointed with sharp bones, and at hand they fight with the sword without any regard for their own safety. And while the enemy tries to defend themselves, they entangle their limbs with a noose to deprive him of the power of riding or resisting. None of the Huns plow or touch any agricultural instrument. They have no fixed abode, and they live in wagons. They are faithless in truces, delighted by every new suggestion of hope while giving way to every furious incitement. They are insatiably covetous of gold. Chinese Accounts The French Orientalist Joseph de Guines postulated the theory in the 1750s that the Huns who attacked Rome and Western Europe in the 4th and 5th centuries AD were the Zongnu mentioned in Chinese records. This theory is still debated, but if one looks at the archaeological finds of Han, Magyar, Avar, Scythian, and Zongnu grave sites, there is a striking resemblance, mostly in their golden animal art and their cauldrons which they used for cooking food. What is certain is that the Huns came from the east and were rightfully feared when they were at their height under their infamous king Attila. The Huns under Attila 
Attila was born around 406 AD and ruled the Huns until his death in 453. Attila would rule his tribe of Huns jointly with his brother Bleda. The Huns' recent arrival in Europe shook things up quite a bit for the Germanic tribes of Rome's northeastern borders. The fighting style of the Huns, using mounted archery, left the Goths and other Germanic tribes on Rome's frontier unable to withstand the Hunnic invaders. The Huns seemed invincible for a time. Large populations had migrated into Roman territory seeking refuge from the Huns in the early 5th century. The Roman Empire was not the mighty empire that it was once in Caesar's day. During Attila's lifetime, the empire was split into two, the Eastern and Western empires. It would take every bit of political maneuvering for Rome to survive. By the year 435, the Romans had agreed to pay the Huns 115 kilograms of gold annually in order to keep the peace, known as the Treaty of Marcus. In 440, Attila and his brother Bleda broke the treaty, crossed the Danube, and destroyed the cities of Illyricum. The Romans had removed most of their military from the Balkans in 441 to fight the Vandals in North Africa, and so, in true Hun fashion, Attila lays waste to most of the Balkans, sacking city after city with little to no resistance. The Emperor Theodosius II recalls his troops stationed in Sicily that were intended to fight the Vandals and prepares to make war against the Huns. Attila responds with his campaign of 443. By this time, Attila and his Hunnic horde are equipped with new siege weapons, such as large battering rams and siege towers. The Balkans are devastated as the Huns approach the thick walls of Constantinople herself. Theodosius admits defeat and prepares to negotiate peace terms. The Emperor is to pay 2,000 kilograms of gold as punishment, as well as the annual tribute being tripled. Attila is satiated for a time and returns to Pannonia. During this time, Attila has his brother Bleda killed, and he assumes sole kingship over the Hun tribes and their subjugated vassals. Attila was said to possess the Ishtenkart, or the sword of the Scythian god of war. A legend tells of a shepherd unearthing the blade after one of his sheep accidentally cuts itself on the blade. He presents the weapon to Attila, who interprets the gift as a sign from the divine that he will rule the world. In 450, Attila turns his attention to the Western Empire. He is eventually checked by the Roman general Flavius Aetius, who spent time with the Huns as a child captive. It was customary for child hostages to be exchanged in order to ensure alliances. Aetius must have been very knowledgeable about Hunnic society, culture, and military tactics. Attila gathered his massive horde, which by this time consisted of many of the tribes he had conquered, including the Orstrogoths, Gepids, Alans, and Burgundians, to name a few. Aetius leads a coalition consisting of the Visigoths, Franks, and Celts. The two massive armies clash in one of the biggest and most epic battles in all of history, known as the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, named after the area in France which is near the area of modern chalons en champagne the Roman Visigoth alliance was victorious, with massive loss of life on both sides. The Visigoth king Theodoric was killed in the fighting, and Aetius allows Attila and the Huns to retreat back to Hungary. In 453, Attila ravages the Italian peninsula, but is forced to retreat back to Hungary after plague and a shortage of supplies ravages his army. According to Priscus, Attila dies on his wedding night, apparently choking on blood from a nosebleed, after a night of partying. Battle Tactics The Huns were masters of the horse and bow. They were considered the ultimate cavalrymen of the ancient world. They lived on horseback, and their preferred weapon was the bow. The 6th century manuscript, known as the Strategicon of Maurice, written by the Byzantine Emperor Flavius Mauritius Tiberius Augustus, tells of the military strategies employed by the Huns. The Strategicon mentions how the Huns are cunning and prefer to defeat their enemies by surprise. They do not form regular battle lines like the Romans, but spread out in irregular formations according to tribe or clan. They keep their baggage and spare horses on their flanks and behind them. They prefer to use long-range weapons, feigned retreats, and ambushes. The Huns preferred a double-edged, relatively short sword similar to the Roman gladius called the Spatha. However, they mostly fought with the lance and the bow, although they were known to lasso their victims from time to time. The Hunnish bow was typically around 150 centimeters in length and was asymmetrical, 
with the upper limb being longer than the lower one. This is a 30 pound horse bow by Kashai of Hunnic Design. Check out archeryhistorian.com for more. Thank you for watching.